very much. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, we will be doing effective pest management. Um, and yes, from the NSSF team, we welcome you all and hope we can teach you something today. So, I think time if you can change the slide for us. Oh, shoot, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Can any of you remember when you did your initial studies, what is the definition of a pest? Um, a nuisance. Uh, what do you call it? In a structural environment? Or... That's a, so, when we look at uh, an insect in its natural environment, it's not a pest. As soon as it um, starts interfering with man or their belongings or their pets or their domesticated animals, either damaging, uh, making them sick, killing them, then it's classified as a pest. So if you can do the slide, they won't cross there. So with the Ensistex, a little bit of humor, it is the professional Ensistex solution today. We are not pests, pensistics, but we help you guys to control the pests. <laughs> I don't know about that one, but yeah. Okay, so as you can see, uh, what is a pest? Anything that competes with humans, domestic animals for food or water, injures humans, domestic animals or structures, or spreads disease to humans, domestic animals or wildlife. For example, harmful to health. So yeah, we've got health pests, and these we will mostly deal with when it comes to HACCP sites or edited, audited sites. It will be your cockroaches, your rodents, and your flies. We do have mosquitoes if you work in malaria areas, KZN, Mozambique, some areas in Africa, huge problem with mosquitoes. Then we've got our nuisance pests on the side there. Sorry, guys. You can just move that window to the side. Back in. The one where you had. <laughs> so ants, bed bugs, birds, termites, stored product, insects, your SPI. So yes, they can cause health and they can cause damage, but this is very much orientated to our HACCP, uh uh, programs. So, what is IPM? We all know what pests need. They need three things food, water, and harborage. Ba the basic definition of IPM is to deny pests access to these three things. Now, here comes an interesting part. What do our clients expect of us? Miracles. <laughs> As Tanya says, miracles. They expect pests have completely disappeared and will okay. never return. Okay, wait, sorry, guys. This will be effective. Sorry, we've got some technical issues here. Just give me a second. Sorry, guys. I can't trust me. Skipping it there. Okay, sorry, guys. Okay, so they expect one treatment and the pest will not return ever. They expect pest control to be effective even if hygiene and sanitation is not up to standard. <clears throat> they expect that one treatment will sort their problem out also forever. We often deal with these difficult situations when we, when we see our clients or we treat our clients. Even if you're not physically there, your PCOs are on site, you deal with the calls later or your receptional recep receptionist deals with it and then you deal with it eventually. You can do the next slide for us. What do pests think of that? As you can see, they laugh at the customers because that is not the reality of pest control. We do not eliminate pests, but we control them. Okay, so what is IPM? Integrated pest management is a science-based common sense approach 
for reducing populations of disease vectors and public health pests. IPM uses a variety of pest management techniques that focus on pest prevention, pest reduction, and the elimination of the conditions that lead to pest infestations. So basically IPM means don't attract pests, keep them out, get rid of them in the safest, most effective methods. As you can see there, it speaks about the safest methods. So any IPM program, when you do your inspections, you've got to see, you don't go to the most extreme measures of pest control. You've got to see what is the safest, most effective way, because we've got to keep in mind, uh, if you look at your risk assessment, what is the risk to food contamination or product contamination when we treat a site for specific pests? Okay, so what is the role of the PCO? Inspection, very important. You will see this guy from Auckland Pest Control. He is not too old because he's going down on his knees still. We know the PCOs get a bit older in age when they don't go down on their knees. They put the gel on their <laughs> that's it. They put the gel on their fingertip and they slightly go okay. down and put the uh, pesticide down. But as you can see, torch in the hand, very important when we do inspection. Not only do our eyes focus on the area, specific area where the torch shines. For those that can't see, I'm actually shining a torch here. And if there is a cockroach, even if the, the room is lit and you switch on your torch, if you go over area, you might not catch a very small cockroach infestation. But as soon as your light moves over there, the cockroach will move away from the light, you catch the movement, and then you can go investigate and sort the problem out before it becomes a big issue. The same with rodents, and uh, if you're going behind a cupboard and you just look with your eye or behind a, a freezer or so on, the chance of it moving is very little. As soon as you put light behind there, it's going to try and run away from that light. So a torch, very important. So, just go back slide for me. Two slides to the. There we go. Oh, sorry. What are the guys can enter? Thanks. We're just getting some new relatives here. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, welcome back. So, we're just speaking about having a torch as a PCO with our inspector. Okay, very, very important to identify as well as see small infestations before they become a big problem. Then knockdown. So knockdown, once you've done your evaluation, there is a big problem. You will not go to a maintenance or control. You want to knock down those initial numbers, get them down to an acceptable level where you then can maintain with the safest possible treatments. Then maintenance, this is the one, maintenance and control are basically the same. It's the one we use most of the time. If you're looking at cockroaches, you'd mostly be using um, glue traps and gels as safe as possible to control them. Once you've got a huge infestation, you will not try and control it with gels and baits. You want to use more effective methods. Then, very important, record what you do because the auditors will look at your files. Okay, You need to record for your own uh, inside the next time you go to this, do the service or next year when you do the service, you look at your trend analysis. Recording, very important. And then report on what you see. Take photos. Speak to the manager. Speak to the supervisor, maybe in that specific division that you're treating. Talk to them about sanitation, uh, stacking methods, stock rotation, those kind of things. Very important. Okay, so you've got the health base again, your cockroaches, rodents, flies, and you can do the next step for us. So your inspection sh should identify anything that might cause a, or allow contamination of food by pests or the activity, or even your treatment, whatever pesticide you're using. So proper pest identification is extremely important. We'll carry on a bit more about that once we go to the specific pest. 
use of historical information. If you're on site and you're doing your evaluation, especially your initial one, don't shy away from asking the owner. Say to them, I want to see the file of the previous company they treated here. Okay, you need to know what you're dealing with. If they've been treating, sorry, yeah. what they've used. That's it. If they've been treating, let's say, with a pyrethroid for the last five years, and there's a major infestation with cockroaches, and you go and you decide, you know, Rudolf came to see me, or Geraldine came to see me, they spoke to me about Max Thor, Max Thor Turbo, even, I'm going to kill these cockroaches. Guess what? Max Thor Turbo, Max Thor is a pyrethroid you are not going to get the desired results. You need to look at the historical information. <gasps> Sorry, guys. If it's your own files, you need to look at historical information. Like I said, again, look at your trend analysis. See what's coming up. Be prepared when you pack your buckies as a PCO, your vehicles, to go and do the treatment. If you see, you know what, from next month, the flies are increasing in numbers. I need to pack more ILT glue boards so that I can make sure all the ILTs are serviced properly. Pest sightings and complaints, very, very important. Again, with historical information, you can see what the history on that site is. Has the previous company been telling these guys, housekeeping is not up to standard? Then you know you've, you've got a fight ahead of you. You need to take proper, pre or, you know, proper precautions and uh, steps to make sure that they comply to the information you give them. Trend analysis, like I said earlier, extremely important. Then surveillance of adjacent properties and suppliers. It could be a case where you do your inspection and you see there's always rodents coming in by the specific hangar or door. Take your torch out. Go see. What is causing this? Go to the adjacent property. Maybe there's a rubbish area there or they've got a lot of containers stacked and there's a problem there. You can go and speak to the manager of your current client and you guys can go see the, the neighboring property and create more work and also lessen your, your efforts on the specific site. Uh, suppliers, same story. You might get an SVI in uh, a pallet that gets stacked in a pick and pay or a warehouse, and you see the SPI that busy firing out, then you know one of the suppliers have a problem. Okay, we can go to the next slide here. So, are you dealing with a low or high infestation? This is notes you will make when you do your, your evalu evaluation. What are the species present? Where are they located? What are the numbers? the extent of the infestation. Big thing, what is the risk to food safety? So your risk assessment, okay? If it is in an area where there's open food being produced or on a production line, then often the case is that production line needs to be stopped immediately if there's a high risk to food safety. And then you would not go to maintenance treatment, you would go to your knockdown treatment to Get those numbers sorted out as quick as possible so the production line can carry on. And then what is your proposed methods of control? Then information on the premises, potential entry points of pests. Often you'd find when plumbers come and put new geysers or piping and so on, they break a massive hole through the, the wall to put the pipe through. They don't seal that hole properly. There's new entry points. You need to make notes of these. What is your exclusion recommendations for those entry points you see? Might be as simple as a, a, a shutter door that's not sealing at the bottom anymore because the rubbers are perished and broken down. Hygiene and housekeeping requirements. This is something we all deal with. At every single site, probably, mm -hmm. that you will come to, you'll see certain areas where housekeeping and hygiene is not up to standard. Storage and stock rotation processes, another big headache. Uh, guys are lazy. They pack the new stock on top of the old stock. We all know what happens. You'll get pest breeding with mice, rodents, uh, mice, rats, uh, cockroaches, SPIs. 
And then again, risk assessment. What those potential areas and pests and problem areas, what is that risk to food safety with those potential areas? Okay, so your food safety program, you'll see very close to the top, exclusion and accessibility. We should concentrate on that. Then storage practices. If we can get the customer to change their storage practices and fall in line, remember you are the professional on site. Okay, once they fall into place, guess what? Your problems will lessen and you can control with the most effective and the safest way possible. So your pest management professional need to communicate any sanitation or housekeeping and hygiene constantly. Remember, even if your customer is not listening to you, you record that in your file and you make the manager sign next to it every single service. Because if an auditor comes out and you have not filled that in every single time, guess whose problem it becomes? Comes your problem as a pest control uh, professional on site. If it is filled in and they they see, oh, here's a problem, they go to the file, they see, but you've been telling this customer constantly, guys, you need to lift your stock off the floor, leave a gap for me to do inspections and to treat. They have not done it. Guess whose problem it becomes then? Comes the customer's problem, not yours. Okay. Yeah, we come down to the pests. So cockroaches, what are their habitats? Most of us know these things because we've been in the field a lot. Where do you hunt them down? Cracks and crevices, appliances, wall and light fittings, clocks and posters, storage, fire blankets. We often find the cockroaches breeding in the fire blankets. Dispensing units, lockers. So lockers are ablution very important areas because that's where you get cross-contamination. Guys take the pest from the business back home and they bring it from home back to the business. So that is an area that you need to do proper inspection to control it there so that you don't get infestation back into your site. Hot water and wall-mounted dispensers, table, chairs, and booths. Again, if there's not a dustbin, and sometimes even if there's a dustbin right there, the guys chuck the bones and pieces of food in the bushes there. There's always shrubs close by to make it look pretty. Rodents start breeding there. You need to take photos of this. Show the area warehouse manager. Show them these things so that they can get their standards up to date. Air conditioning units, another area we, we can hunt there. So you we just summarizing here, there's loads of other areas you will find cockroaches. Um, I'm sure you all have some stories from when you <laughs> cheated where you find the cockroaches. Like we can do the next. Okay, so here we've got the two. We get quite a couple of uh, different cockroaches in South Africa, different species. But these two we deal with uh, mostly when we're looking at ASAPs and ASAP sites, audited sites. So American and German cockroaches. How would you know the difference between the two? Antenna. 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 Size. Okay, very important. Now you do your inspection with your torch and you find an immature American cockroach. How do you differentiate between the immature? Because it will probably be the same size as an adult uh, German cockroach. If you look at the picture of the German cockroach, you'll notice two lines behind its head. American cockroaches don't have, well, I suppose it depends on how you see it. Some people might see the middle line as one line. If you look at the dark lines, it's two lines. So here you can differentiate exactly, you know, you're dealing with the German cockroaches because the treatment, the areas you would treat for the two will be different. You might find an American cockroach uh, where the German cockroaches are, but you will go look for its nesting area in a different space, usually dark, damp areas, drain, drain. that kind of thing. But just a, a point to look out for to make sure you're dealing with a proper pest. Okay, so here we get to the cockroaches, the products and application method. 
Just a quick one on, on cockroaches. We all know one cockroach, female cockroach, within a year, if you take her, uh, the females, at eggs she lays that are females and they produce so on, you can get one million cockroaches easily from just one female cockroach within a year. So very important when you do inspections and treatment to make sure you get to the source and eliminate that source there so that it makes your life easier. You can go to your uh, control methods. So aerosol flushing agents, you can see here how aerosol got a very, very handy nozzle that you cannot lose. It's not going to shoot off when you spray. So that's your cracking crevice. You point it down, you've got your normal spray. Very effective tool to use when you're doing your inspection as well as when you're doing a knockdown treatment. Max or Turbo would be my recommendation if you're dealing with a high infestation. Okay, so Max or Turbo, Aerothorn. If you've got an area where you've got a, let's use a freezer because usually there's cockroaches behind the freezer. So you would take, mix on your Max Thor, read your label proper, properly as Tanya showed us yesterday. Know your risks before you start working. Know the PPE you need to use. Then you mix on your Max Thor Turbo. You would spray a band around that freezer, around the back of it, on the wall and on the floor. Okay. Then you move your freezer over and you spray the ground where the freezer was standing and you can move your freezer back. Then to save on your, your, your cracking crevice spray, your flushing agent, you just give two bursts where the motor is and you will see the cockroaches run out into Max or Turbo, which kills them within about a minute. So there you're saving on aerosols and flushing agents because your initial max or turbo is a lot less expensive. So this will be for our knockdown. Insecticidal residual sprays, we covered maxol, bithol, as most of you know, if your rep has seen you, we've got dual actives in there out of two different classes of pesticide. So we've got uh, pyrethroid and we've got uh, neonicotinoid which is imidacloprid. So we've got by fentanyl and imidacloprid. So it breaks resistance. And so if you've got an area where you've seen through looking at the previous pile, they've been using, for instance, by fentanyl for years there, or any pyrethroid for that matter of fact, then you would go with bifor and aerothor to treat the, to do your knockdown. Or you can go to fipronol, which is in a class of its own again. We get insecticidal baits, granules, and gels. So basically, we've got hymenopthal, atrothal, which is our liquid gel, call it our liquid gel, and then you've got your gel baits. This we would use with a trapping method when we're doing maintenance and control. So every day you find the one odd cockroach that comes in with new stock, there's gel, they die. Your traps, you'll see we've got the permanent trap here, the plastic one. And then you've got your disposable trap. It's called a disposable trap because when you put it down, first time they mop the floor, it's basically gone. When they move the equipment, they're going to remove it and chuck it away. You will use that to often when you do an inspection. You put it down today, tomorrow you come back. You read it like a map. If your cockroaches are moving from the left-hand side, if you see all of your cockroaches are on the left-hand side of that trap, then you will look to the right of it to see where they're coming from. Okay, so if they, right. if they this side. It's this side. Okay, and it's against the wall this side. You know your cockroaches are moving from the right-hand side going into the trap. If your trap's on the other side, once again, it gives you an idea where your infestation is coming from. Your permanent trap. Okay, the nice strong plastic one is made to last very long. Uh, unfortunately, you guys can't see, you guys that are on Zoom can't see, but this is the permanent one strong plastic. It's got a removable glue board on the inside. You can stick double sided tape or you can screw it into the wall. Opens easily for you to change the trap. The longer this is in place, the more effective it gets. So 
I suggest to everybody, remove the glue board, put two or three drops of gel on the inside of the lid, put the glue board back. Even if that glue board gets full, there's gel in there that the cockroaches can eat and die. The longer this is in place, the more natural pheromones of the cockroaches stay behind and the more attractive it gets. That is why whenever you're dealing with a, a freezer, you can have an old freezer and somebody can bring in a brand new freezer. You've killed the cockroaches on this old freezer. But any new cockroach will go to the old freezer. They won't go to the new freezer. And the reason for that is the natural pheromones that stay behind from that massive infestation before you treat them. If you go and clean that motor area, get rid of, excuse me, <laughs> if you get rid of those pheromones, then they will not be nearly as much attracted to that area. So exactly the same happens with the trap. The longer it's in place, the more attractive get, it gets. And the glue board, any new cockroach that goes in there, gets stuck on there. They don't con contaminate any food. The egg sac that comes out the female, those 15 to 40 cockroaches get stuck on there. They don't start breeding. So on a little trap like that, you can easily catch 50 cockroaches. Mm -hmm. That's 50 less that you've got to deal with next time you come. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting to the rodents. So I drew up a quick chart for the rodents. This to, to give guys an idea of how quickly rodents can multiply. So rodents, when they have all spring or pups, they'll have about a 50-50 male-female ratio. And female has one litter. And I took the, actually, we're going to get to that. <clears throat> we'll get to that. Okay, but we'll look. Sorry, I'm jumping the gun here. There's something. To that there. mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll we'll find them in burrows at waste areas. When we do our inspection, we'll find them at burrows, generator units, hot by the generator units, usually undisturbed for long periods of time, built-in flower boxes, specifically by dining areas. We spoke about the guys chucking their bones, chicken bones, their drains. Plant foliage, they love ivy because of the ground cover. They don't get disturbed, like nobody can see them. They love palm trees, they love to eat the dates. Broken down equipment, vehicles standing for long periods of time. <laughs> Unrotated stock on pallets in receiving, wall cavities and ceilings. So when we find a lot of these Areas, the foliage, broken down equipment, vehicle. Remember, when we do our inspection, even if we've been treating there for five years, you've got to do inspection every time. When you see this, take photos and you report those photos. Okay, this is where I was jumping the gun. Know your enemy. If you look at the Norway rat's feces, you'll see, you'll, see, you'll know it's quite a bit bigger than a roof rat and obviously your mouse, but you'll see it's rounded, fairly rounded on the edges. That's one way to differentiate between. Okay, average weight, optimum conditions, half a kilogram, okay? If it's not so optimum, 200. When you look at food consumption, very interesting, they eat 10% of their body weight every single day. And we'll get to why that is important. Then, lifespan, about a year for an adult. Litter size, between 8 and 12 pups per litter. Litter per year, max of 7. So I've taken on this chart I drew here. Sorry, guys, on Zoom, you can't see it, unfortunately. But I'll, I'll, I'll read the information for you. I took a, a litter size of 6 for the female. I don't do the max. I also, uh, the litter per year, I took a litter size of eight, about the minimum there. So one female rat will have eight rodents, which will, four will be females, okay? They take about three months before they get to sexual maturity where they can start breeding themselves. Then you'll go second litter, another eight, which you've got four females. Now there is eight females, including uh, nine females. Third litter, again, eight, another four females, but 12 females, 13 females, including her. 
by the time we've got, she's got a fourth letter. Remember, after that, she still has another two letters. Now that first letters females start having their own letters. Okay, now you've got four females laying or having eight pups each. That's 32 rodents. Okay. And she herself is having another eight pups. So that brings a total of female rodents to 20. Okay. Or total rodents currently 64 from that one female. It is fourth letter. Fifth letter she has. Now you've got the the next, the uh, second letter is four females added to the four females you had previously. Now you've got eight females laying or having eight pups. Each. I'll keep on and say laying eggs. I don't like eggs. <laughs> eggs. Eggs. Her eight pups. So in total, you have got 72 rodents from that letter plus the previous 64 rodents. You've got a total of 136 rodents from that one female in five letters. But now we've got 56 female rodents already. Now, here she's having a last litter, the sixth litter. She has another eight. Okay. Now you've got four, eight, twelve, the first, the, or the third letter plus the first two letters. Twelve females having eight pups each. Okay. That gives us a total of 104 from one letter, plus the 136. Now you've got 240 rodents. Let's go a little bit further. She's died off, or she's too old to have litters. Now it's just the females. We've got 96 females from that original letter. Now, plus, here you can see B. We've got 20 new females, having eight each. We've got a total of 496 rodents with by the seventh letter. By the eighth letter, I'm not going to bore you with the details, we've got 1,200 rodents, all from one female. This takes just over a year. From one female to 1,200 rodents. Why I'm getting to this is, so it's a long way of getting to it. You can see an adult rodent can eat up to 10% of its body weight each and every single day. Think about what is most of our rodents' blocks weight. 10 grams, am I right? Yeah. And guess what? A lot of your standard operating procedures out there are one block per base station. I hear this often with the PCOs. They get told you're only allowed to put one block per base station. Why I'm bringing this up, if you look at the numbers, the way the rodents breed, if you find an empty base station and you just put one block in, not only are you not scratching the surface of that rodent infestation, you actually are building up resistance to the product because one rodent can easily eat up that one block in the day, leave a few crumbs behind. Another rodent will lick up those crumbs. If it's a female, her pups will start building a resistance to the specific actor. So very important. If you've got an empty base station, what should you do? That's it. So instead of putting one block, you increase your blocks. Let's say you fill it up. Base station can take eight blocks. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's eighty grams. If you look again at what one rodent can eat in a day, still not a lot. Next time you come back, remember, most has subsides within a week. You've got to do your follow up. You see, it's empty again. Now you can't add more blocks to that base station. What should you do? You install another base station. Even if it's a temporary one, you fill it up. If it's empty, both empty again, you've got to install another base station. You've got to treat until you see there's some bait left. Then you know you're starting to control the rodents of this. It could be a specific bur bur uh, burrow close by. Again, take your claw chart, go and inspect. If you can find the burrow site better, you can treat the burrow, you reduce your numbers. But I just want to bring across the point, you cannot always put one block per bait station because you're not going to sort out a problem if there's a problem. If you have one block in a bait station, it's untouched or slightly eaten, perfect. You can just put one block back. But if it's empty every time you service, you've got to increase your bait until there's some bait left. 
Okay, now we're going to get into the roof rat. Similar story, they're about half the size, 260 grams, optimum conditions. Again, they eat 10% of their body weight. Lifespan about a year, litter size less than your Norway rat, uh, litter per year, also a little bit less. I'm not going to go through the whole process of how much they can reproduce because you can see it's quite a lot if left untapped. Then we've got the mouse, much smaller. As, oh, sorry, just go back to the previous one. I wanted to point out. If you look at the, the droppings, you'll see your roof rat has pointed edges on the droppings. Now, yes, I'll be slightly smaller than the, the Norway rat, but they've got pointed edges. Why that is important is, let's say, I've had a, a, a site where I visited when I was still doing best control where the guys called me in the PCO said we're not getting rid of the problem. The bait uh, that the company is using is not the rodents aren't eating it. There's constant red droppings. Bait is untouched. We did a bit of an inspection. We looked up. There was a gap in the roof. And it was actually roof rats droppings with the wind blowing, falling down, and it looked like they were running across a wall. Meantime, they're in the ceiling. So... Knowing the difference, like we say, know your enemy, very, very important when you're treating. Okay, mice, much smaller. As you can see, they weight at the most 30 grams. They eat a little bit more than their body weight. Ah, body weight, 10% of their body weight, a little bit more than that. Also, lifespan of a, a year, litter size, a lot, 8 to 12 again. So you can just imagine how many mice can breed if you don't have enough bait or you're not finding the areas. One thing you need to keep in mind with mice, they're sporadic feeders. Okay? They'll eat a little bit here, then they'll go to another place, eat a little bit there, eat a little bit there. They're a lot more difficult to control overall than rodents are. Rodent, often, if it likes what it eats, it will eat until its stomach is full. Not so much a mouse. They also drink a lot less. Optimum conditions, they will not drink at all. They'll get all the moisture they need from the food they eat. So again, if you're treating with liquid baits, be very careful with mice. Not guaranteed that they'll drink the liquid bait. What do we use to control them? Rodenticide baits. We've got extruded blocks, not wet blocks. We were told very <laughs> strongly by Steve, we do not have wax blocks. The only difference there is we use a lot less wax in our blocks, which means it's got a much higher melting point. So if you're working in hot areas, and I have certain areas in Pretoria, areas like Dal, areas in the free state get so hot, the blocks always melt off the, the rods inside the base station. Extruded blocks, much higher melting point. This is what we would use mostly when we're treating for rodents. Am I right? The, bug, the, the biggest tool in our bulb. Monitoring blocks are non-toxic monitoring blocks. Not my favorite. Usually by the time you see, oh, there's a problem that mouse or rodents longer already started breeding. If you have to use monitoring blocks, use our monitoring blocks because You've got the added benefit. It's got uh, fluorescence in. So if you use our torch and you've got the purple torch and you shine, at least you can then trace the rodents' feces and trace where they're going. Gives you just so much more to work with than your standard uh, monitoring blocks. And some of your clients will insist that you do use them. Like I say, rather use something that gives you something extra than just, oh, there's a problem. Baiting equipment, base stations. We cannot chuck rodenticides loose behind uh, machinery or in the roof. Uh, we had a customer walk in yesterday that did an inspection by a spa. He says the rodent bait was just chucked everywhere loose. Uh, you're going to cause major issues. Remember, always before you treat, look at your... Do your risk assessment. What is risk to food safety? Back break trapping methods. I would much rather use this than a mon monitoring block. The reason is when you see there's a problem, there's usually a dead rat or mouse in that trap. Okay. These, unfortunately, or fortunately, 
need to be checked every single day, often twice a day. If you or your PCO is not on site constantly, you must train somebody on site, usually several people, okay, because they're all in some factories and uh, workshops and so they have people working different days of the week. So somebody needs to check these stations every single day or twice a day, and they need to, again, report that. In Sistics, we've got our Rodenthal Digital that makes your life so, so much easier. Once that trap goes off, the movement will send a signal to your phone. Immediately, you can notify somebody on site. They go and change it, reset the trap. Guess what? It works again immediately. Tonight or an hour later or two hours later, you can catch multiple rodents with one trap. Then you've got your 24-7 traps. So these are used, you catch multiple mice, but again, they need to be checked several times a day or at least one times a day. You cannot let the, the mice or the rodents, uh, and usually these are only for mice who catch immature rodents, otherwise they're too big to get in there. You cannot leave them to die of hunger and thirst in there. You will have major issues mm -hmm. if there's a order. Okay, so with rodent Proofing, you've got big circle here, as you can see, public participation. Very important that your customers work with you. The guys in the different departments need to work with you. Elimination of food and shelter. Once you've done that, big job initially, but once you've done that, remember, now you can treat safest, most effective way. Rodent proofing, extremely important. And then lastly, you'll see a small part of the participation is trapping and poisoning. And remember, this is IPM. Pesticides must play a much, very small part in any IPM program. So, oh, sorry, sorry. as you can see with that last moving sign, that comes in, it says, it takes all to make it a success. Sorry, that's an inside joke. It is an inside joke. Steve gave us a hard time with it. Slides. Yeah. Here's another one, just for your pleasure. <laughs> you can press the. So why is successful rodent control often so difficult? Okay, it's because of man kindness and an indifferent attitude. When it comes to man kindness, is you keep telling the guys clean up your rubbish. Uh, sanitation and hygiene needs to be up to standard. You need to lift the pallets off the floor so that we can clean and inspect under it. You need to make sure your rubbish areas are removed every single day. All these things, that's man kindness and also an indifferent attitude. You know what? I pay you to kill the rodents or kill the cockroaches. It's your job. When your clients do not work with you, that is the reason why rodent entry can be difficult. Okay, if you thought the rodents were bad, you're going to see something else with flies. So flies, what are their habitats? Garbage, waste areas, human or animal excrement or feces, decaying fruit and veggies. So you will not find the same species of flies by human excrement or decaying fruit and veggies. You will, we will have a look later on at the different species. And if you've treated, if you've been in the field a long time, time, you will know what flies. If you look at the fly, you'll know where to look. Remember, you always want to find the source. Uncleaned garbage bins, stagnant water areas and sewage and animal carcasses. These are the areas. And remember, there's lots of other ones. We're just taking your most prominent ones. So here we're going to use the flesh fly as an example. You can see adult fly, then they lay eggs. And if you look here to the left, up to 325 eggs that will become larvae. First instar, uh, larval stage, second, third, then they pupate, and then you have another adult fly. Okay, This whole process, from adult fly to adult fly laying eggs again, 20 days only. Then the, fe the female can start laying eggs again. From hatching to laying eggs, 20 days. Okay. 
Another important fact is lifespan of an adult fly, about a week. It's not a long time. In that week, mm. that is the main purpose of the adult fly is to lay eggs and propagate. Okay. Here comes the very interesting part. Again, it is so important when you inspect and you find a problem area to act immediately. Don't think, you know what, when I come back with the next service, I'm going to then pack my bucket and I'm going to be ready to sort out this problem. What you saw with the rodents, how quickly they multiply. There's never going to be a case where you've got one female rodent that's got pups. There'll be several. So the numbers on the, the rodents increase by three, four, five times if you've got several teams. Now we get, again, sorry guys, on Zoom, you can't see the chart here. It's not very pretty though, because my handwriting sucks. But at least you guys can bad. read. So, as I said, egg, egg to adult fly laying eggs, 20 days. So, let's take circumstances on optimal. Okay, so I'm going to again not take the maximums. I'm going to say one female cat can lay up to 325 eggs. But again, there's other flies that can lay several batches of eggs, up to six batches with 150 eggs in each batch. So you can actually increase it depending on the fly species. But let's divide that number of larvae by two. We say one female, 160 eggs survive, 160 flies survive. Okay. We divide it by two because their male-female ratio is also about 50%. 40 days later, 80 female flies lay 160 eggs each. You've got 12,800 flies, okay, 40 days late from one fly. And again, there's never a situation where there's one female fly. 60 days later, so we divide the 12,800 by two. We've got 6,400 that lay 160 eggs. Guess what? In two months, you've got 1 million flies if left unchecked. Okay, let's take it further. 80 days. 1 million divided by 2, because we've taken the females only. A half a million laying 160 eggs. Okay, 80 million flies. Take it one step further. 100 days. And remember, this is just over 3 months. Okay, just over 3 months. We divide the 80 million by Two, we get 40 million that lay 160 eggs. You've got 6.4 billion flies with just over three month period. It's not a long time. You might have visited that site three times or two times, depending on the situation. So if you see ooh, flies are starting, you do not do something about it. Within three months, you can have a major infestation. And you will see this if you're treating um, any chicken houses. Uh, by the time those guys realize there's a problem, and usually you probably book, you'll say, you know what, I'll be there hopefully two, three days' time if you've got this fight. By the time you get there, it's probably four times as bad as when they initially uh, contacted you. And that's because of the breeding. Okay, so here's your different flies. Blowfly on the left, fruit fly. So decaying fruit and veggies, guess what? You're not going to get your uh, grain fly or flesh fly there. You're going to get your fruit fly. Grain fly. Can you guess where you're going to find that one? <laughs> Standing water by the drains. You often find them if you do supermarkets and so on. You find them flying around. Mm. Flesh fly, guess where you're going to find that job? Meat, blood, house fly, cluster fly, horse fly, and then the crane fly. Okay, so what is the control method for flies? Baiting traps. Okay, so this, our, our baiting trap, the fly free, uh, similar to your red tops, not so similar. The fact this can last you two years. So the client pays once and you can keep treating it for up to two years. What does it control? Which stage of the life cycle of the fly does a bait trap control? 
Probably the adults. Adults fly, correct. Now we get insect light traps. Okay, you can see the beautiful LED and our black uh, buzzard here. We're getting some black ospreys in. It's going to be stunning as well. What is your insect light trap? Which life stage of the life cycle does your insect light trap uh, treat? Adult fly. Eh? Okay. Residual spray. What stage of the life cycle do you usually treat residual spray? We usually spray it where the flies are sitting. So it will be your adult as well. Fly bait. Beautiful, stunning fly bait. Vectorful fly bait works like a bomb. I've got some videos where I help the customer treat in a chicken house. If you want that video, you can ask me. I'll share it with you just to show the attraction. So fly baits, um, if you do request training on flies, we go very intense into the treatment. But fly baits work on a sex pheromone, okay, which attract your flies. Read your label carefully. Do, do not put more than the label says because you're actually going to chase the flies away from your fly bait, they are not going to, to lick that or get attracted to it. They'll get attracted from far as soon as they get close to fly away. Um, so read your label, only apply two labels. But what does it, what stage of the life cycle does it treat? And all again, eh? The only way, place you are getting treatment for your uh, first, second, third and fourth, okay? is your insect growth regulator or your, uh, another word is a larva site. But this is the most important with any flying program. Remember, I'm specifically speaking, yeah, you've got to do your inspection and get to the source of the problem. Unfortunately, it's not always possible. Then you've got to start looking at neighboring uh, premises or suppliers. Okay, but once you find the source, you can mix your insect growth regulator with an adulticide like Bithol. We suggest Bithol for fly treatment. And you are treating the larval stages. Remember, you have got four different larval stages. You've got four times the amount of success with your insect growth regulator or larval site when you treat flies. So please... If you need more information, if you want training on flies, we've got one coming up. Um, you can speak. If you've got a couple of guys, speak to your rep, ask for that. Uh, you can learn a lot. But I cannot stress the point more. An IGR or larva side, extremely important in controlling flies. Even cockroaches. If you've got a serious problem with cockroaches, mix an IGR with your max or turbo when you treat going to help those nymphs from becoming adults. Just stops the process. If you use the IGR by itself, remember IGR is a chitin inhibitor. Mammals, we do not have chitin. We do not have a hard exoskeleton. So it is probably one of the most safe products you can use when you're treating. Also, remember when we work, what did we learn? We need to Treat pests in the safest, most effective way. Your IGR for flies is the safest, most effective way that you can treat. Okay, then we get nuisance pests, ants, birds, earwigs, centipedes, fish moths. Those are your casual invaders. Oh, sorry. I'm ignoring you. What do we use for that? We get bait traps for those. You can use insecticidal baits, read your label, make sure it's registered, and then insecticidal sprays as well. Okay, we are launching very soon a product called Flock Off. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it already, specifically for bird control. Promise you more information and launches will come when we get the product uh, really exciting. Expensive, but there is nothing like it currently. Okay. So thank you very much for your time and appreciate you guys coming and logging in. Um, if you do have questions on Zoom, please welcome to WhatsApp your rep uh, and we will be able to answer those questions, share whatever information we can share with you guys. I hope you all have a lovely weekend. I don't know if you want to say something. To yes, thank you, guys. As usual, we always appreciate all of you attending, all of you listening. Um, it's a new initiative, so we're quite excited with the last two days. 
we've had a quite a hectic time with everybody. But thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Um, we always appreciate our close family. So please have a great weekend. Enjoy. And we'll see you all and speak to you all next week.